Hello, my friends. This is a review of an Iroquois museum replica that I had made. Hello, my friends. I had the opportunity to get a hold of a museum uh, piece of a Iroquois uh, bow, and I wanted to uh, make a replica so that I could shoot it. I didn't want to string the, rep the uh, museum piece, fearing that it would break. So I took the measurements um, and was able to trace the bow and made a form. And I took a piece of hickory uh, and steam vent the hickory, got it to size. And I went through the tillering and uh, it's close to being ready to take its first shot with an arrow. And I'm excited over that. Uh, being a smaller bow, uh, the very first five that I made, I broke each one. And so I thought I couldn't have been that bad at making the bows, that I had to be doing something wrong. And with a little research, I found that uh, first I had to get a hold of some arrows. So I got a hold of seven arrows. Uh, and some of them still had the feathers on them. They were also old. And they came from across the country, different areas, different locations. And all these arrows were measuring 22 to 23 inches in length. And Typical arrow length uh, that we use and hunt with are, is about uh, 30 to 32 inches in length. That's quite a bit difference. We're talking possibly uh, 8 to 10 inches difference in length. So what I found out is uh, these shorter arrows were made for this shorter bow. And I was overdrawing. I was using the European draw going back to my cheek and that's putting a, uh, about a 32 inch draw and I was snapping every one of the bows. So when I came up with the uh, shorter arrow, uh, the bows don't break. The other thing that I discovered was the natives or indigenous people weren't doing the European draw to their cheek. They didn't sight down the arrow. They were all instinctive shooting. And uh, they have a tendency to shoot from the rib cage. And once you do that, your draw automatically goes to the 22 to 23 inches. And the bows don't break. So this bow um, is close other than the ends. I had them sawed square on the museum piece. It was crude, but they were uh, carved, cut, and sort of pointed. So I'm going to do that to mine. Uh, I don't like the idea of it being machined. This is a very natural shape. Um, the back of the bow, you can still see there's this, this coloration. This is hickory. The coloration uh, is still a little bit of the cambium layer that uh, still didn't get off, but it darkened from oxidizing. And uh, the, back, the belly of the bow is nice and smooth. I already sanded this. I still left a little bit of my center line uh, because I'm still playing with it on the uh, tillering stick. Uh, there is one flaw on this bow, and if it's going to break, it'll break at the flaw. And that flaw, you can see on the uh, back of the bow, there's a, uh, a bit of a knot. On the belly, it doesn't come through, so it's pretty shallow knot. Uh, it probably was where a new 
bud was going to form. Because of that flaw, what I did is I made this area right in here just a tad wider than the corresponding area on the other side. And same thing with the thickness. This thickness here is just a tad thicker than here. So when I put this on the tillering stick, it looks pretty close. There may be slight differences in here, this area, because of that. But it's pretty acceptable. Now for tillering, um, I'm not using a bowstring, I'm using a piece of paracord. And uh, I have a knot, a loop, tied in one end. And I just slide that on there. This other end, I'm using a bow knot or a timber hitch is what it may be called. You just make a loop. It's kind of like a, a loop. It's kind of like a slip knot. So you place that over the other end and lock it on. Lock it into the grooves. So that end is locked. Okay, now we want to, want to string this. And uh, I'm using my legs because I want to bend it evenly and pull that up. Okay, right there and right in line with my uh, center line here. I put a line on my string, the tillering string, dead center of the bow. Now when I use it on the tillering stick, let me back this up a little bit. I'll back up. Okay, the tillering stick, it's kind of a crude piece out of 2x4. It doesn't have to be fancy. But every two inches you see I have a mark. And from the yoke, bottom of the yoke, I measured down. The first measurement here is six inches. And you really don't need to have the, the uh, numbers on here, but it does come in handy. It's usable when you're measuring the poundage of the bow. So the way you do that, first of all, for the tillering, you place the center line in the yoke, dead center, and then you stretch the bow the cord like that and then you can eyeball sight this and look to see that these are symmetrical with one another if there's an area that's not bending you foul that area and you can do that while it's under tension I do it on the tillering stick and then it's sanded smooth Okay, then to measure the poundage, we want to measure the poundage at the uh, draw that you're going to do. And for this bow, we want to go 22 inches. So I'll show you how I measure the poundage for this. The uh, end of the tillering stick on my bathroom scale. And what I'm doing then is just pushing down. And this is where the numbers are coming in handy. I can push this down, right there is 20 inches, and right there is 22. And when I do that, I observe the poundage on the scale. And right here, right here we're observing as I push down, you can see the poundage going up. There's 20 inches, there is 22. We're at 35 pounds at 22 inches. Now, the instinctive shooting that the Indians would do uh, came very natural to them. Uh, the Indian child was giving a bow uh, at a very young age, they were toddlers, and they grew up with the bow and arrow. And um, they taught a natural way to shoot. The European method was the three fingers, and they, the Europeans set their arrow on the inside. So to 
set an arrow, they had to come across the bow. The natives, on the other hand, would set the arrow on this side, and they didn't use a European uh, hold or draw on the bow. As a child, they were taught just to pinch the arrow with their index finger and thumb and pull back. As the bow became higher in poundage as they got older, they would still pinch the arrow, but they would cross the index finger across the string so that the index finger would have the power to pull back a higher poundage. And this method, resting the arrow on the outside of the bow, would allow them to throw an arrow up much quicker and uh, be able to shoot a lot faster. Uh, certain individuals were bragged about that they said that they could launch seven arrows in the air before the first one could hit, before it would hit the ground. And I don't know if that's true or not, but that's uh, how the myth and the reputations were, that they could launch a lot of arrows. And they were very accurate in their shooting. Children as a game would go and call, uh, they had a, a method that they would call chipmunks. They would hide in the brush, call chipmunks, and the chipmunks would come out of their hiding. And when they would come out, they would shoot chipmunks with their bow and arrows. They used to also shoot at small birds. And uh, it was not sighting off the arrow. It was all purely instinctive shooting. Okay, to shoot this bow, I made a crude uh, arrow. I don't, I don't want to shoot the authentic arrows. I would be afraid of damaging them, especially ones that still had feathers. So I went and made an arrow to test. This arrow that I have here, I made, it was hurriedly made, but it does work. It'll shoot out of this type of, or this size of a bow. And the shaft itself is made out of a piece of arrow wood that I cut here on my property. And uh, it's a traditional style. But this would then be thrown to this side and knocked. And you don't have to look at the knock, you would feel. And it, you know, we were always taught that uh, if three feathers, one feather always went to the outside. Uh, when these were shot rapidly, it didn't matter where this went. It was just knocked real quick. And you can see here the finger grip. You pinch the arrow and the index finger wraps around the string and it would be drawn drawn by pushing pushing the bow away and pulling apart at the same time this is ready to shoot so I'm excited over that to finish this bow what I intend on doing and what the native would have done is taken bear fat and rub the bow with the bear fat and that would seal moisture uh, from getting overly wet, getting too high of a moisture content into the wood. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to use my, my universal hand cream which is beeswax and olive oil with lanolin and I'll use that on the bow and that will give a similar finish especially with having a beeswax on there it would make it pretty much waterproof. The other thing that I will do is right in the handle I'm going to wrap the handle with uh, rawhide and uh, that'll give it a, a grip uh, for that. Um, the, this type of a bow where the handle area is very similar to the, the uh, limbs, 
the handle also bends with the limbs. So this entire length, even though it's a short bow, the entire length is bending. Now if you would compare that to a longer bow that has a handle that is thicker in the middle, that area where the hand is, is about four inches. And then you have a transition on both sides of about two inches. So that's eight inches of bow that does no bending, so there's no working in that area. So in comparison, this bow would be effectively eight inches longer uh, to a uh, longer working bow. And then a lot of the longer bows had a recurve at the ends. That recurve didn't do any bending, so that section of recurve could be considered an area that's not working. It uh, makes a quicker uh, action with, with the uh, release, but it'll give you an area on that longer bow that uh, is only a working area and it can compare to this bow in length. So this, this is very functional. The, the only disadvantage is when you overdraw this, it makes too much of an extreme bend and they will break. So this one is uh, working at 35 pounds at a 22 inch draw. And I think that is powerful enough to shoot one of those arrows with a uh, flint tip uh, to penetrate and kill big game. The arrowheads that most people call an arrowhead uh, really was a spear point. The arrowheads actually were much smaller. In fact, a lot of times they said they were bird points even though those type of an arrow was still being used to hunt large game. The uh, larger tips were on the spears, usually around the six foot length spear that was uh, thrown with the addle addle. And uh, people don't ever even talk about that, but that existed for thousands of years uh, in comparison to the bow, which is relatively a newer instrument in the Americas. So, we're ready to go. Here I'm looking at three different bow lengths. They're in three different jigs. And I want to make a comparison between the traditional native bow, the Iroquois bow that I have here. That came off of this form, this one right here. And you can see the, the uh, amount that this is already under tension. And this one is going to be quite a bit stronger. It's thicker and it's made out of Osage. And I'm leaving it in the form to uh, completely dry. This is Osage. It's a longer recurve. And you can see here the handle on this. The handle is in here. And the transition comes down in both directions. So this still has to be uh, worked on. It'll be thinned out, but this amount of area will do no bending. And from here on up into this area, this is gonna do all the bending. So if you look at this compared to half of this bow, here's my center line I'm holding. Okay, you could see that the short bow has the same working area, or even actually more. And then on the long bow, this is six foot, same situation here. This is, has a form fitting handle. It's upside down, of course, that's why my hand's twisted. Transition period comes in up to into here, both directions. So from here up into this area, this is the area that does all the bending. So even out of a six foot uh, longbow, um, we're coming close to the same bending working area with this Iroquois bow. Now the 
string that would be used with this type of a bow would have been a gut string. You know, they, everybody heard a cat gut for musical instruments. Well, uh, what you would do is you use an intestine that was cleaned and uh, trimmed of its fat and stretched and dried. And a few of the uh, layers would be twisted together. A few of the membrane would be twisted together to form a, a bow string that would be relatively thick enough to be able to hold that knock on, on the arrow. <clears throat> now, it would make a very strong string. The bows, on the other hand, were never strung until it was ready to be used. And typically when the Indians would go out hunting, they would carry a second bow with them, and that second bow would be in a protective uh, sheath to keep it from moisture, to keep it dry. And uh, if the bows would get wet or uh, had to be strung too long, they would lose their effectiveness or possibly even break. So they almost always carried a second bow with them. Uh, Thanks for watching, my friends. Bye-bye.